Welcome to Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. In each episode, we salute champions of data and AI, the change agents who are shaking up the status quo. These mavericks are rethinking how data and AI can enhance the human experience. We'll dive into their challenges and celebrate their successes, all while getting to know these leaders a little more personally. Welcome to the Champions of Data and AI. I'm your host, Chris D'Agostino. In this episode, I'm joined by Jack Berkowitz, Chief Data Officer at ADP. Jack and I explore how his technical and product background is helping him lead and execute on the ADP data and AI strategy to bring more awareness on pay equity and build new services and products beyond payment processing. He will also share his views on creating a data strategy centered around defensive use cases first. In other words, how to protect your data and your brand before tackling the offense-based ones, the ones that make you more money and reduce cost. Let's get started. All right, Jack, thanks for being on Champions of Data and AI. Hope you're doing well today. Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Chris. Awesome. So let's get let's dive right in. So a couple things. Want to have the audience get to know you a bit. And uh, I know that you have a background in software programming and want to talk a little bit about like when you built your first production application. So the very first production application was a long time ago, 1983. Uh, we were trying to correct some accounting system in a print shop. So we had to write a little bit of print shop code. And so a long time ago, Apple IIe, little floppies going back and forth. This is post-college, pre-college. I was in high school. I was in high school, junior in high school. Awesome. So, yep. all right, um, let's talk about data. You collect a lot of data. You have, you represent thousands of customer or companies and, and millions of, of employees. I was struck by the pay equity uh, data analysis that your company had done, and you presented a bit of it at the reInvent conference. For those viewers that didn't see Jack's presentation, I would just you know do a YouTube search on it, and it's it's great. Um, can you walk us through though quickly, kind of the highlight of that, and let's chat a little bit more about uh, some of the insights that you found? Yeah, so you know we collect all this information and we help people understand it one of the big things that we do is we build a people analytics product so we have uh clients that will use the people analytics you know to track their headcount but also do things like understand the compensation footprint for their business one of the things that we built over the past year is a view for them to look at pay equity gaps so pay equity gaps are you know what most people identify you know uh, a woman makes less than a man for the same type of job or the same work, but it also extends to, you know, people of color. It can extend to people with disabilities, it could extend to veterans as well, right? So there are pay equity gaps throughout that. And what we did is we took a look at pay equity gaps. We rolled out this new capability and we, and we saw what companies were doing with it, right? Um, you know, to step back, Unfortunately, over the past couple of years, what we see in the data overall across the country is that pay equity gaps, whereas they looked like they were improving over the past couple of years, actually because of so many people that have lost jobs, um, the pay equity gaps are actually getting worse, worse for women overall. Um, but there's, a, there's an upside to that. By using the types of tools, by putting the data at the fingertips of clients, both their data as well as combined with all this external information, people can take action. And in just a few months, we saw over a thousand companies take concrete action, um, return 720, and it's probably even more than that now, $720 million into their communities and it equated about $3,500 per person, right? To make adjustments to close that gap. And so, so the hope is, is that people keep using data for good in this way. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one of the interesting insight that if I'm interpreting it correctly is that you know, prior to the pandemic and the change in the workforce, if you looked at the average salary for people in these, you know, underrepresented groups that you mentioned, women, vets, dis disabled people, people that lost their, you know, lost their jobs during the pandemic tended to be lower wage earners and were disproportionately among those underrepresented groups. So 
during the pandemic, the average pay looked like it might have gone up. And then, but when you factor those lost jobs back in and the wages, the lower wages associated with them, that that pay gap actually was was worse. Yeah, that's right. It got worse for everybody, you know, okay. um, and, and it's because of certain industries being affected, right? Yeah. So you and I work in the, you know, software industry and, you know, it's boom time, right? Yeah. You know, nothing's ever been faster than in the cloud industry the past couple of years. But if you look at accommodation, or if you look at transportation, if you look at retail, even if you look at manufacturing here in the States, or, um, you know, just a massive impact, massive amounts of people losing, losing, losing work, yeah. or people dropping out of the workforce, right? So you'd have, um, you know, because of childcare, or because of, you know, needing to take care of adult parents, people choosing to drop out of the workforce. And it turns out that that's created, you know, really tough times for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that talk because you presented some interesting statistics about ADP and, and the amount of money that you process in your platform to, you know, deliver a paycheck to an individual so that they can, you know, feed their families and pay, pay the rent or pay the mortgage. Uh, and you plotted the, the, you said if ADP and the money it was processing were the GDP of a country, it would sit somewhere between France and Italy, which when yeah. I saw immediately reminded me of Italy winning the 2006 World Cup and Italy just of course won the, the 2020 uh, Euro tournament played just in 2021. And so we're, we're now coming up on the World Cup, which Italy will of course win. So uh, I just, I found it fascinating that you're processing that much money uh, on behalf of individual consumers, employees. Yeah, you know, it was, it, was a, it was an analogy that I've needed to make to understand the impact of what we're doing, right? Um, and the criticality. If we were to, to have either, you know, issues with, with processing, or if we don't take our software incredibly seriously, it's not like missing some advertising. It's not like, you know, oh gee, I gave somebody the wrong ad. Right. If I mess with somebody's paycheck, well, it's a substantial impact on people. Right. And it's substantial impact, not just on one individual, but on, you know, the economy overall. And so I'm always struggling for analogies, how to make data approachable. And I'm glad that was memorable. Uh, I know there's debates, uh, my friends in France and we ADP has a big business in France as well as Italy. This has been impactful to them right now. Um, there's a lot of arguments about who has better food as well. So I'm willing to go referee. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I was just in France uh, just a few days back. So the food there is quite good, but I'm, I'm biased towards the Italians, of course. Uh, speaking of bias, let's talk about bias in data. Let's talk about, you know, the importance of the data that you work with, not only in terms of just keeping people's livelihoods going, but also you, you mentioned uh, ADP is an HR platform and the ability to do recruiting, um, you know, ostensibly a, a client of yours could post a job through ADP, uh, advertise for a particular position, maybe federate that out through different job sites and then collect resumes and you can run machine learning models against the applicants to figure out who might be best qualified. Um, so with all this data that you've got on people and the importance that ADP plays in the role of just employment and livelihood, talk to me a little bit about ethics and ensuring your data sets are of good quality. How do you approach solving for that? How do you measure if you're you know, using the, the data that has no bias baked into it? Or maybe an example, if you've determined that there's some bias, what do you do to remediate it? You know, give us some insights there. No, it's, it, it's a great question. It's something we think about every single day. Um, so as we started to really ramp up in our machine learning and data journey, this is going back uh, more than a couple of years ago, we stood back and we said, you know, we really need to get some principles outlined. And so we stepped back, we formed a group, both internal AD people, ADP people, as well as some external uh, experts on the team. And we stood up a data and AI ethics board. And we set forth you know, and it's published on our website, the principles that we're gonna use to guide ourselves, right? Um, and, and one of those is, is that bias exists, right? We, we don't wanna make the statement that things are, are not biased. We know bias exists, but therefore we have a responsibility 
to monitor, understand, and advise when these situations are there. And so, you know, fast forward now two years, we've implemented a pretty robust ML operations uh, playbook as well as system um, that allows us to understand what the data is, the data shape, data shape changes over time, things about data drift, looking at scores and understanding those, and actually running very specific tests that are applicable to the HR industry in the ML ops uh, system. So we, we know if there's a, a situation going on and we can, we can immediately correct it. Now we have people who's got eyeballs on this constantly, as well as being monitored as this, you know, just most software is monitored. You know, why, why do you monitor for uptime and not monitor for bias? Of course, we're gonna monitor for both. And, and then, so we take actions, we have policies and procedures in place for that as well. So let's talk a little bit about the technology stack. You know, if you look at sort of some of the public uh, presentations you've given, uh, you know, one could maybe say like you, you tend to be pretty open with the best of breed, like consider best of breed, uh, you know, the right job for, or the right tool for the right job kind of approach. Uh, where does, so one is that characteristic characterization fair. Number two, how do you think about open formats, open standards, you know, transparency in the platforms that you use? Tell me a little bit about what goes into your thinking when you're selecting a particular component of your architecture. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I believe really strongly in openness. Um, I spent sort of the mid part of my career working in uh, the semantic web technologies, which were all around you know, the sharing of self-describing data and self-describing knowledge formats. Um, I believe strongly in things like SQL. Why? Because, you know, there's 5 million people that know how to write SQL. And it's important for you to be able to interact in a common language. Um, and, I, and I believe that by, by keeping things in that way, um, with, with the sharing of things, we can build architectures and components that allow us to build things that we could never imagine over time. Now, the thing about selecting best of breed technology is sort of there too. At a certain point, there will be platforms that can encapsulate all the pieces of tech that I need or that we need. But at the same time, if we stick to openness, then we can plug and play those pieces that we need over time as well. And so, yeah, today there are eight components that we might need to stitch together to perform a function. Maybe tomorrow I can get them from just one, one component, one vendor or one, one open source thing. Be fantastic. As long as I'm building it in an open way so that the data can be moved, so that the queries uh, can be readdressed, then I have a chance to do that. If I, if I, if I go lock in to just a, you know, a, a core platform uh, and I can never get out of it, then I'm, I'm constrained by the development pace of the platform that I've chosen. And, you know, I don't know what, what's going to come the next two years. Um, I don't know what the demands are from, from our company or more importantly, from our clients. And so I need to have a system that's flexible enough to allow us to meet those demands. And, you know, that was part of what we were talked about uh, with AWS. That's part of this entire cloud move. That's why you know, we work with folks uh, like Databricks is to be able to build platforms that allow us to be flexible, um, you know, to, to allow us to build new capabilities that we hadn't anticipated even four or five months ago. And that's, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, so it sounds like to, maybe for me to summarize this back or, or play this back to you, it sounds like if you standardize on data as a product using standards and formats that are portable, you can mix and match the tooling to meet the need of the use case or to meet the demands of the business. And if you can find something uh, from an architectural standpoint that maybe simplifies your architecture a bit, reduces the number of moving parts that you've got to worry about keeping up and running uh, without sacrificing that flexibility and portability of the data and resisting some kind of lock into a platform or to a, you know, uh, a proprietary data format or something, uh, that's kind of how you guide uh, through. Yeah, that's structure. right. That's right. That's, a, that's exactly right. Over time, you know, things come together, things break apart. We just need that flexibility. And, and you know, it's important, at least for my career, it's been important for this interoperability 
to happen over the past 30 years. And I see no difference today uh, not to continue down that, down that path. And it's, it has served ADP really well. It served our clients really well over the past couple of years. So talk to us a little bit about the ADP data cloud. What is it? What's the objective? Uh, I know data sharing is, a, is an element of it and, and help us understand what your goals are there. Yeah, so at ADP, um, we want to make use of the data for our clients' benefit, for the country's benefit. You know, one of the things that we publish is a thing called the National Employment Report, which every month our research institute puts out. And it's a view at the information, all anonymized, all aggregated, so it's not personally identifiable, but a view of the information to inform what's happening in, in the U.S., as well as in Canada, as well as some other places from an economic view. So to do that, we have to bring together all that information. We have to align all that information, right? How do we take 20, job, 20 million job titles and align it down to 9,000 so people can look up compensation benchmarks? So the data cloud is really about putting all that together. And then on top of that, we build products or capabilities that allow people to, to take advantage of it. So people analytics, which is a set of products that we sell or data that we license or that we provide um, for people doing compensation analysis for their companies, or maybe they're doing demand planning. So supply chain demand planning based on the economic shifts inside of the country. And so we, we build those types of things. And then we also build some things that are just to service our clients better, right? So how can we use that data to create um, shorter wait times for clients or to have the system proactively repair? So our HR system. So some of what we're doing with that information, it's actually providing better HR or payroll services to our clients. Oh, that's great. Well, I would imagine with that much data across that many industries and as many countries as you operate in, you're seeing labor trends probably earlier than almost anyone else. Yeah, yeah, we do, right? So we update that information for the public monthly, right? And that allows you to see, for example, we just published a few weeks ago, we know how much job switchers are making in improved salary, right? It's about six, it was about 6.6%. And we can see that literally within a few days at the end of the month. Um, we can watch the economic recoveries. We can watch those swings. And that information, you know, companies like I was talking about demand planning, companies can make adjustments to what products they're stocking, where their warehouses are, even you know their driver schedules or their delivery schedules, based on understanding that information, um, you know are people commuting? And if they are commuting, have there been changes in the acceptable commute over the past two years? And it turns out it has. It's been cut about half, right? So people are willing to commute still, but not as far as they used to. Or maybe they're we not required, perhaps they're not required to as much, right? With hybrid working models and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's but. hybrid working models, but but again, only about 30% of the population is allowed to do that. So you and I are working from home, but there's yeah. still a bunch of people that aren't. Yeah. Right? No, yeah, well, I mean, that's interesting that, yeah, you know, sometimes in our industry, we take for granted because our our lives are so oftentimes so very different, especially from people in the services industry where they're tethered to the place the service is offered or, you know, a particular- That's right. I mean, it's, it's great we can be digital nomads and you and I can order Grubhub from, you know, a mountaintop in, uh, I don't know where, right, uh, Colorado, but somebody's got to actually drive that up to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody always, you know, if you read the tech papers, you think everybody was the ones, you know, being digital nomads, but there are other people and, and they're important. And yeah. so we need to make sure that both people, both sets of groups or both groups of people are treated fairly. Yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there's any insight, uh, you know, this is just sort of off the cuff question about like where people are moving, given the people that have the ability to now be more flexible with where they, where they, you know, work from home, they're opting to leave, you know, expensive place areas to maybe areas less well, expensive. Well, it's funny, more. right? So, so there's two things that I know are true right now. It's true that everybody's moving either to Austin or Miami. Yep. Okay, that's true. Um, but it's also true that the people in Austin and Miami are getting that that we're living there um, are actually getting displaced, right? Yep. So you know, lower income people uh, actually moving to the suburbs or to other towns 
so that yeah. they can afford. So you actually see that ripple effect where people are leaving California, leaving New York, but then you see that ripple effect on the economy, which opens up new, new opportunities, Chattanooga or Asheville or Nashville, right? Yeah. These are all areas where there's going to be new vibrance in terms of people moving, people wanting to work. Yeah, that's great. Well, you're talking to somebody, San Francisco, and I'm here now in Miami. So there you go. You hit the nail on the head. All right. So the role of the CDO, let's switch gears and focus on that for a moment. You know, as I said earlier, it's I, I speak to a lot of executives in, in the data space. We have ones, that, you know, very few of them kind of span both skill sets on the policy side as well as the technology side. And oftentimes the ones that are on the policy side, what I hear from them either publicly or privately is the challenge around not having enough teeth in the role for on the implementation side, right? So it's this struggle, very real struggle between, okay, they're setting the policy agenda for the organization, but now they're having to partner or defer to the IT organization to implement things. And the way IT organizations are oftentimes structured, it's less about a data platform, data ecosystem environment, and how you bring together data from across the enterprise. It's more about one-off applications and their backing data store and the security model and you know those kinds of things. So tell us a little bit about the CDO role that you have and its ability to kind of influence both the policy and the implementation details. That's a great question. So, you know, because I came up as a product development person and my first few years here were really about product development, uh, we, when we define the CDO role, we defined it a little bit different. I'm the first CDO, right, at ADP. And so we defined it maybe a little bit different than, than other companies, but it's, it's proven to work for us. So we really look at it simply. We have defense and we have offense, right? Now, you notice I put defense first. Normally people say offense first and then defense. But in today's environment, with everything going on in terms of threats and situations, um, we find that defense for the data, and defense is not just protection of the data, but also our ability to recover, but also things like um, data governance, right? Where is the data? Is, is it being handled appropriately? What's master reference data? What third-party sources? What are the models? Are the models actually uh, compromised. All of that is an important part of the CDO. So we can set policy, but we can also set in practices, work with our CIO, work with our chief security officer to bring that together. Now, at the same time, I retain my product development role. And so we build products, right? We build products for internal, we build products that we monetize. And monetization is an important part of the modern CDO. I think a few years ago, the CDO for companies were like, well, I'm just an internal thing, I'll set policy. But today companies want to see a return in one way or the other, right? So the ability for us to do that either directly or through enterprise value calculations is an important part. So both of those go hand in hand. And that's allowing me to partner with, uh, with our CIO really closely and our, and our chief security officer really, really closely uh, to bring together a kind of a, a a view across data that, that's just refreshing, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I joke, right? I built these tools for years. Now I have to use them. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so, so it's pretty funny, right? So. Yeah, no, I, it's interesting that you talk about offensive and defensive. I, I have an ebook that I authored uh, on behalf of the company uh, that kind of goes through a 10-step strategy. And one of the things that it talks about are use case selection and the use cases being binned in a couple of different ways. And the first most granular way or coarse grained way, sorry, is uh, in offensive versus defensive and starting with the defensive ones, the ones that are going to protect your brand, the ones that are going to protect your data from a data breach. Those are the ones that you've got to get to first. That's right. And ensure that you've secured the data. Um, I, I was at Capital One during the data breach. I have some inside knowledge on how the breach took place, what caused it, what the remediation was and then what we needed to do differently as a company and how we had to align resources around ensuring the, the broader security of the data, uh, you know, within- Yeah, it doesn't it's no good to talk about, you know, billions of dollars of benefit if it's built on a creaky house yeah. of, you know, 
yeah. cards or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, so we really are spending a lot of energy. The data platform, people immediately say, oh, well, that's so that you can get business advantage. Yeah, but the data platform is really about security and defense, Yeah, right? lineage and everything else. Yeah, so then you, you take that, you take the offensive and the defensive ones, you tackle the defensive ones first. The offensive ones in terms of revenue, increasing revenue, reducing costs, those kinds of things are great. And then I tend to bin them into three performance categories, sub-second SLA response time. So very fast, high speed, uh, event-based type decisioning. Uh, the second is multi-second. So where you can afford, the customer can afford to wait a few seconds for something to execute. And then multi-minute, some of these longer run, anal big analytic processing model training exercises, things like that. Um, and, and so really thinking about it as like, which ones do you tackle first, the defensive ones, how do you figure out what the architecture needs to be to support a given use case? And then the final piece with use case selection is really around data adjacency. So easier to tackle use case A and B that have an 80% overlap in the data that they need to execute versus use case C, which has zero overlap and it's a completely orthogonal data set that you need to go after and figure yeah. out. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we're really focused on right now is for that data adjacency is which data domains do we onboard into this full protection line lineage governance model. And as we start to bring on which data domains are fully managed, then, you know, do we get these adjacencies? You know, it's hard because you start to think, well, I got to bring on my client's data first, or I got to bring on this or that. And it's got, you know, as anything, it becomes a spider web or you get this octopus effect. But eventually all that information needs to come together. You know, an area that, that we're working on and we don't want it to sound like, a, you know, object models from the 2000s, but we are working on semantics, yeah. right? And because you have, you're starting to see now in the industry, oh, I need a metric store. Well, for, for those of us who've been around a while, you're going to need more than a metric store. You're going to need dimension representation, you're going to need object representation, and all of this type of sharing needs to come together. Jack, it's been great talking to you. If you can just tell us, um, you know, what advice would you give to an aspiring CDO, uh, someone, you know, like you said, there are people that have sort of helped shape the direction you've gone in your career. Uh, what things would you uh, recommend to people that really have a passion for data, want to elevate sort of their executive presence and, and maybe get to a role like what you have dealing with the volumes of data you're, you're dealing with. Yeah, I think there's really two things. First of all, do what somebody did for me. Give somebody a chance, right? Give somebody a chance. You don't need to be the smartest person in the room. We talked about being the dumbest person in the room, but really it's about um, building those teams. Those teams of talent are really the thing that happens. You know, I always like to say, yeah, I just took credit for what these guys did. And it's exactly the intent, the intent. Right. Because, you know, giving people a chance to rise and shine actually bolsters the entire company as you go. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is really start to listen. Um, a lot of people like to talk. Um, we're talking right now. And a lot of people like to hear, but they actually don't like to listen. Right. And so actively listening to what your company needs or what your client needs or what that individual engineer needs at 2 a.m., right? Well, she's fixing, you know, the latest security issue that you, you need fixed the next day for the CEO. Uh, these are important traits that, you know, so I didn't talk about technology. I didn't talk about going to some conference someplace. Didn't talk about, you know, posting something on LinkedIn. It's really about, you know, building a great team and being part of a great team and, and really listening to what people need. And I think these are the two most important things. This is what my mentors told me, sometimes in a very brutal way, you know, like, listen, damn it. Uh, but it's important and it's really important uh, to share that with others. Thank you for joining this episode of Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. Thousands of data leaders rely on Databricks to simplify data and AI so data teams can innovate faster and solve the world's toughest problems. Visit databricks.com to learn how data leaders are unlocking the true potential of all their data.